The wind howled like a banshee, flinging ochre dust against the reinforced glass of the research station. Inside, Dr. Eris Thorne barely noticed. Her gaze was fixed on the swirling patterns displayed on her monitor, a symphony of chaos that was Cestus Ivi's weather. It was a symphony she desperately wanted to conduct. Cestus Roman III, a planet hailed as humanity's new frontier, was proving to be a fickle mistress. Its volatile climate, swinging between scorching days and frigid nights, was punctuated by dust storms that could strip paint off a starship and torrential downpours that turned canyons into raging rivers. The colonists, hardened pioneers from Earth, struggled to eke out a living from the unforgiving soil. The station's door hissed open, admitting Captain Anya Petrova, the flinty-eyed commander of the colony's defense force. Anya surveyed the scene, her gaze lingering on Thorne's disheveled figure, hair a wild mane, lab coat stained with the omnipresent dust. Still chasing storms, Thorne? Anya asked, her voice a dry rasp. Thorne turned, a spark of defiance in her eyes. Not chasing, Anya. Understanding. Cestus's weather isn't random. There's a pattern, a hidden melody, if you will. Anya raised a skeptical eyebrow. A melody that's cost us three farms and a transport this month alone. Precisely, Thorne retorted, because we're dancing blind. But what if we could learn the steps, lead the dance instead of being trampled by it? Anya sighed. Thorne's theories were bold, bordering on the outlandish. But there was a glimmer of desperation in her eyes that Anya couldn't ignore. The colony was teetering on the brink and the Interstellar Council, dominated by the technologically advanced Arcturian Empire, was growing impatient with humanity's struggle to tame this wild world. Their conversation was interrupted by a shrill alarm. A message from the Council was incoming. Anya's expression hardened. Speak of the devil, she muttered. The holographic projection that materialized was of Ambassador Kale a towering Archerian with shimmering scales and eyes that seemed to pierce through one's soul. His voice, smooth as polished obsidian, dripped with thinly veiled contempt. Greetings, humans of Cestus Roman III, Kale began. The Council has reviewed your latest progress report, and I must say, we are unimpressed. Thorn bristled at the patronizing tone. Anya, however, maintained her composure, a mask of stoic indifference. Kale continued. Your inability to adapt to the planet's climate is concerning. It reflects poorly on humanity's capabilities and casts doubt on your suitability for this colony. Thorne's hands clenched into fists. She wanted to lash out, to defend their hard-fought progress. But Anya silenced her with a subtle shake of her head. Ambassador, Anya said calmly, we are well aware of the challenges, but we are a resilient species. We adapt. We innovate. We will not be deterred. Kale's lips curled into a sardonic smile. We shall see, Captain Petrova. We shall see. With that, the transmission ended, leaving a heavy silence in the research station. Thorn turned to Anya, her eyes blazing. They laugh at us, Anya. They think we're nothing but primitive apes fumbling in the dirt. We have to prove them wrong. Anya met her gaze, a spark of determination mirroring Thorne's own. We will, Thorne, she said, her voice firm. We will. The sting of Kale's words lingered like the aftertaste of a bitter fruit. Thorne paced her lab, the rhythmic beep of her instruments a counterpoint to her racing thoughts. She couldn't shake the image of his condescending sneer, the thinly veiled threat in his eyes. Damn them, she muttered, kicking a stray datapad across the floor. They think they're so superior, so advanced, but they can't even predict a dust storm five minutes out. Anya, who had been silently observing from the doorway, stepped into the room. Anger is a powerful motivator, Thorn, she said, her voice surprisingly gentle. But it can also blind us. Thorn stopped her pacing, her gaze locking onto Anya's. I'm not blind, Captain. I see what they're doing. They're trying to undermine us, to make us doubt ourselves. Anya nodded. I know. And that's why we can't let them win. We need to focus our energy on finding a solution, not stewing in resentment. Thorne took a deep breath, the tension slowly easing from her shoulders. 
Anya was right. She needed to channel her anger into something productive, something that would not only silence the Arcturians, but also ensure the survival of the colony. I think I'm onto something, Thorne said, her eyes gleaming with renewed determination. Something big. She led Anya to her workstation, where a series of complex diagrams and graphs filled the screen. I've been analyzing the energy readings from the past year, she explained, and I've found a pattern, a subtle oscillation, like a heartbeat, that seems to correlate with the major weather events. Anya leaned closer, studying the data. And you think this oscillation is the key to predicting the weather? Thorne nodded. More than that, I think it's the key to controlling it. Anya's eyes widened. Controlling the weather? Thorn, that's... impossible? That's what they said about faster-than-light travel, about artificial intelligence, about so many things we now take for granted. Thorn's voice rose with excitement. But what if we could harness this energy, tune it to our will? We could stabilize the climate, make this planet truly habitable. Anya stared at her, a mixture of awe and apprehension on her face. It was a bold idea, a dangerous idea, but it was also a tantalizing one, a glimmer of hope in the face of overwhelming odds. Thorn, she said slowly, if you're right, this could change everything. The next few weeks were a whirlwind of activity for Dr. Thorn and her team. They worked tirelessly, fueled by a potent mix of adrenaline, coffee, and the burning desire to prove the Arcturians wrong. Thorn's lab became a hive of buzzing energy, filled with the hum of instruments, the glow of holographic displays, and the constant chatter of scientific debate. Anya, despite her initial reservations, proved to be an unwavering supporter. She secured additional resources for Thorne's project, shielding her from the bureaucratic red tape and the skepticism of some of the colony's more conservative scientists. She also ensured that the defense force was on high alert, in case the Arcturians decided to intervene. Thorne's theory once dismissed as the ramblings of a maverick, began to gain traction as she amassed more evidence. The energy signature she had discovered, dubbed the Cestus Pulse by her team, was indeed a key factor in the planet's chaotic weather patterns. It interacted with the atmosphere in complex ways, amplifying storms, triggering droughts, and shifting jet streams. The more Thorne learned about the pulse, the more confident she became in her ability to manipulate it. She designed a series of elaborate devices, a network of interconnected energy emitters and absorbers that would resonate with the pulse and subtly nudge it in the desired direction. It's like playing a cosmic instrument, Thorne explained to Anya one evening, gesturing at the holographic model of the device. We need to find the right notes, the right chords, to create the melody of a stable climate. Anya, though not a scientist herself, was captivated by Thorne's enthusiasm. She could see the passion in her eyes, the unwavering belief in her own theory. It was infectious. And you're sure this will work? Anya asked, her voice laced with a hint of worry. Thorne smiled, a confident glint in her eyes. No, I'm not sure, she admitted, but I believe it's possible, and that's enough for me. Anya returned her smile. Good, because I believe in you, Thorne. Their moment of camaraderie was interrupted by a buzzing sound from Anya's wrist communicator. She glanced at the incoming message, her expression hardening. It's Kale, she said grimly. He's demanding a progress update. Thorne's heart skipped a beat. This was it, the moment of truth. She had to convince the Arcturians that her project was not only viable, but also essential for the colony's survival. Let's show them what we're made of, Thorne said a steely resolve in her voice. Thorne met Kale's holographic gaze with a defiance that surprised even herself. Gone was the disheveled scientist, replaced by a woman radiating confidence and resolve. Beside her, Anya stood tall, her military bearing an unspoken message of strength and unity. Ambassador, Thorne began, her voice clear and steady. We appreciate the Council's concern, but rest assured, we are making significant progress. Kale's eyes narrowed, his voice laced with skepticism. Progress? Your reports suggest otherwise. The colony's agricultural output remains abysmal, 
and your infrastructure is constantly under threat from the elements. Thorn smiled, a hint of amusement in her eyes. That was before, Ambassador. We've recently had a breakthrough, a discovery that will revolutionize our ability to adapt to Cestus Roman III. Kale leaned forward, intrigued despite himself. Oh, do tell. We've identified a unique energy pattern, Thorne explained, a pulse that permeates the planet's atmosphere and influences its weather patterns. We believe that by manipulating this pulse, we can effectively control the climate. Kale's amusement vanished, replaced by a mask of cold disdain. Control the weather, such arrogance, you humans barely understand the most basic principles of atmospheric science, yet you dare to believe you can manipulate the forces of nature. Thorne held her ground, refusing to be intimidated. We've already conducted preliminary tests, Ambassador. The results are promising. We believe that with further development, we can stabilize the climate, mitigate the storms, and create a sustainable environment for our colony. Kale remained unconvinced. This is a dangerous path you tread, humans. The Council does not condone reckless experimentation with natural forces. We are not reckless, Ambassador, Anya interjected, her voice firm. We are scientists, engineers, explorers. We push boundaries, seek knowledge, and find solutions, and we will not apologize for our ambition. A tense silence filled the room. Kale's eyes darted between Thorn and Anya, his mind racing to assess the situation. He had underestimated these humans, their determination, and their ingenuity. Finally, he spoke, his tone carefully measured. Very well. The Council will await your next report with great interest. But be warned, humans, if your experiment fails, or if it proves to be harmful to the planet, there will be consequences. The transmission ended, leaving Thorn and Anya alone once more, they exchanged a look, a silent acknowledgement of the challenge ahead. The stakes were high, the risks immense, but they had come too far to turn back now. They still don't believe in us, do they? Thorn said, a wry smile playing on her lips. Anya shook her head. Not yet, but they will. Just wait until they see what we can do. The colony buzzed with a nervous energy in the wake of Kale's ultimatum. The colonists, hardened by years of struggle, were not easily intimidated, but the threat of archery and intervention loomed large. Yet, amidst the apprehension, there was also a newfound sense of hope. Thorne's research had ignited a spark of defiance, a belief that they could overcome even this formidable obstacle. In the research station, the atmosphere crackled with feverish activity. Thorne's team, a motley crew of meteorologists, engineers, and physicists, worked around the clock, refining the design of the Tempest engine and preparing for its deployment. The device itself was a marvel of human ingenuity, a testament to their ability to adapt and innovate. It consisted of a central hub, a gleaming sphere of composite materials, connected to a network of smaller nodes spread across the colony. Each node was equipped with an array of sensors and emitters designed to detect and interact with the Cestus Pulse. Thorn, her eyes bloodshot from lack of sleep, oversaw the final preparations, her mind a whirlwind of calculations and simulations. She knew the risks were immense. If the engine malfunctioned, it could exacerbate the weather patterns, causing even greater chaos and destruction. But the potential rewards were too great to ignore. Meanwhile, Anya was busy on a different front. She met with community leaders, rallied the defense force, and ensured that the colony was prepared for any eventuality. She also reached out to her contacts in the Interstellar Council, discreetly lobbying for support and keeping a close eye on the Arcturian fleet's movements. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the dusty plains, Thorne found Anya on the observation deck of the research station. Anya was gazing out at the swirling clouds, her face etched with worry. How are you holding up, Captain? Thorn asked, her voice soft. Anya turned, a faint smile tugging at her lips. Honestly, Thorn, I'm terrified, but I'm also exhilarated. We're on the cusp of something extraordinary, aren't we? Thorn nodded. We are, and it scares the hell out of me too. 
but we can't let fear stop us. Not now. They stood in silence for a moment, watching as the sky transformed into a canvas of fiery colors. Then Anya spoke, her voice resolute. We're ready, Thorn. Let's show them what humanity can do. News of the successful rain spread like wildfire through the colony. Farmers who had resigned themselves to barren fields danced in the downpour. Children splashed in puddles that hadn't existed for months, and even the grizzled miners emerged from the depths to witness the miracle. The atmosphere was electric, a potent mix of joy, disbelief, and a burgeoning sense of pride. The celebration, however, were short-lived. The Arcturian response arrived swiftly, a chilling transmission from Ambassador Kale. His holographic visage flickered with barely suppressed rage. Humans of Cestus Roman III, he began, his voice dripping with venom. You have overstepped your bounds. Your reckless experiment has disrupted the natural balance of this planet, and the Council will not tolerate such interference. Thorn and Anya exchanged a grim look. They had anticipated a backlash, but the sheer intensity of Kale's anger caught them off guard. Ambassador, Anya responded, her voice carefully controlled. Our actions were not reckless. We are merely utilizing the resources of this planet to ensure our survival. The weather patterns on Cestus Roman III are inherently unstable. Our technology is simply mitigating the worst of their effects. Kale scoffed. Mitigation? You dare to call this reckless manipulation mitigation? You have tampered with forces you do not understand and the consequences could be dire. We understand the risks, Ambassador, Thorne interjected, her voice calm but firm. But we also understand the potential benefits. Our technology can transform this planet into a thriving home for humanity, and potentially for other species as well. Kale's eyes narrowed. Your arrogance is astounding. You believe you can play God with this planet's climate? You are but a fledgling species, barely out of your cradle, yet you presume to dictate the course of nature. Anya stepped forward, her gaze unwavering. We are not playing God, Ambassador. We are simply adapting to our environment, as any intelligent species would, and we will not be lectured on humility by a race that has colonized countless worlds and exploited their resources without regard for the consequences. Kale's face darkened his scales rippling with barely suppressed fury. You will cease this dangerous experiment immediately, he snarled, or the Council will be forced to take action. The transmission ended abruptly, leaving Thorn and Anya in stunned silence. The threat was clear. The Arcturians were not going to let them get away with this. The colony buzzed with a nervous energy in the wake of Kale's ultimatum. The colonists, hardened by years of struggle, were not easily intimidated, but the threat of Arturian intervention loomed large. Yet, amidst the apprehension, there was also a newfound sense of hope. Thorne's research had ignited a spark of defiance, a belief that they could overcome even this formidable obstacle. In the research station, the atmosphere crackled with feverish activity. Thorne's team, a motley crew of meteorologists, engineers, and physicists, worked around the clock, refining the design of the Tempest engine and preparing for its deployment. The device itself was a marvel of human ingenuity, a testament to their ability to adapt and innovate. It consisted of a central hub, a gleaming sphere of composite materials, connected to a network of smaller nodes spread across the colony. Each node was equipped with an array of sensors and emitters designed to detect and interact with the Cestus pulse. Thorn, her eyes bloodshot from lack of sleep, oversaw the final preparations, her brow furrowed in concentration. Each node of the network, a squat metal cylinder bristling with antennae, had to be perfectly calibrated to interact with the Cestus pulse. Power levels nominal, a technician reported. Sensor arrays online. We're green across the board, Dr. Thorn nodded, a knot of tension tightening in her stomach. This was it, the moment of truth. She took a deep breath, her gaze sweeping across the vast expanse of the colony, the rows of struggling crops, the dust-laden buildings, the faces of the people who had placed their hopes in her. Activate the sequence, she said, her voice barely a whisper. The technician's fingers danced across his console, 
initiating the complex startup procedure. The central hub of the Tempest engine hummed to life, a low thrumming sound that resonated through the research station. One by one, the nodes across the colony began to glow, their emitters sending out invisible pulses of energy. At first, nothing happened. The sky remained clear, the wind a gentle caress. But Thorne knew this was just the overture. The real symphony was about to begin. Minutes stretched into an agonizing eternity. Then, the first sign appeared. A faint ripple in the clouds, a subtle shift in the wind's direction. Thorne watched with bated breath as the ripples intensified, the clouds swirling and morphing into intricate patterns. The wind picked up, whistling through the station's vents. The sky darkened, the once bright sun obscured by a gathering storm. But this wasn't a natural storm, not anymore. This was Thorne's storm, a symphony of her own creation. The first raindrops fell, large and heavy, drumming against the windows. Then came the lightning, a dazzling display of raw power, illuminating the clouds with an eerie glow. But there was no thunder, only a deep, resonant hum, the song of the Tempest Engine. Thorn watched in awe as the storm raged across the colony, its path guided by the invisible hand of her technology. The rain fell evenly, soaking the parched earth, nourishing the thirsty crops. The wind, once a destructive force, now blew steadily, carrying moisture and pollen across the fields. The storm lasted for hours, a breathtaking spectacle of nature and technology intertwined. When it finally subsided, leaving behind a fresh, clean scent, the colony was transformed. The air was clearer, the sky a vibrant blue, the fields a verdant green. Thorn turned to Anya, her eyes sparkling with triumph. We did it, she said, her voice barely audible over the thrum of the engine. Anya nodded, her face alight with a mixture of relief and wonder. We did it, Thorn, she repeated, her voice filled with awe. We actually did it. The transformation of Cestus Roman III was undeniable. In the days following the storm, the colony experienced a surge of growth and productivity that astonished even the most optimistic colonists. The barren fields, once choked with dust, now sprouted lush vegetation. The air, previously thick with grit and pollutants, was now crisp and clean. The morale of the colonists soared, buoyed by the promise of a brighter future. But even as they celebrated their newfound prosperity, a dark cloud gathered on the horizon. The Archerian fleet, responding to Kale's summons, arrived in orbit around Cestus Roman III. Their massive warships, sleek and menacing, cast long shadows over the planet, a silent reminder of the impending threat. Anya received a terse message from Kale, requesting a formal meeting to discuss the unauthorized weather manipulation. She knew this was no mere discussion. It was a tribunal, a trial where humanity's fate would be decided. Thorne and Anya prepared for the meeting with grim determination. They knew the odds were stacked against them. The Arcturians held the power, the technology, and the influence within the Interstellar Council. But they also had a secret weapon, the truth. The meeting took place aboard the Arcturian flagship, a monolithic vessel that dwarfed any human ship. Thorn and Anya were escorted through sterile corridors, their footsteps echoing in the oppressive silence. They were led to a vast chamber, where Kale and a panel of Arcturian officials awaited them. Kale, seated on an elevated platform, surveyed them with a cold, calculating gaze. Captain Petrova, Dr. Thorn, he began, his voice dripping with disdain. You are here to answer for your crimes against the natural order. Thorn stepped forward her chin held high. We have committed no crimes, Ambassador. We have simply harnessed the power of this planet to ensure our survival. Kale scoffed. Survival? You have jeopardized the delicate balance of this ecosystem with your reckless experimentation. You have no right to interfere with forces you do not comprehend. We understand those forces better than you realize, Ambassador, Thorne retorted. We have studied this planet its weather patterns, its energy flows. We have developed a technology that not only benefits us, but can also benefit the entire ecosystem. She presented the data, the charts, the simulations, the irrefutable evidence of the Tempest engine's positive impact on the planet's climate. 
The Arcturian officials, though initially skeptical, were forced to acknowledge the validity of her findings. Anya seized the opportunity. Ambassador, she said, her voice ringing with conviction, we are not asking for your permission. We are simply exercising our right to self-determination. We will continue to use our technology to improve our lives and the lives of future generations on this planet. The chamber fell silent. The Artrians exchanged uneasy glances, their confidence shaken. Thorne and Anya had turned the tables, presenting them with a moral dilemma they hadn't anticipated. Kale, taken aback by Anya's boldness, struggled to regain his composure. He exchanged glances with his fellow council members, a silent conversation passing between them. The air crackled with tension. Very well, Kale finally conceded, his voice a low growl. We will not take immediate action. However, we will dispatch a team of our own scientists to Cestus Roman III to assess the situation. If we find any evidence of ecological damage or unforeseen consequences, the Tempest engine will be shut down and you will be held accountable. Anya nodded, a grim satisfaction settling within her. It was a small victory, but a victory nonetheless. They had bought themselves time, a chance to prove the long-term benefits of their technology. We welcome your scrutiny, Ambassador, she said, her voice unwavering. We are confident that your scientist will find no cause for alarm. Thorne added, in fact, we invite your scientists to collaborate with us. We believe that by working together, we can unlock the full potential of this technology, not just for Cestus Roman III, but for countless other worlds as well. Her words hung in the air, a bold proposition that surprised even Anya. But Thorne knew that the best way to win over the Archerians was not through defiance, but through cooperation. By offering to share their knowledge, they could turn potential enemies into allies. Kale considered the offer, a flicker of interest in his eyes. The Arcturians were, after all, scientists at heart, driven by a thirst for knowledge and a desire to push the boundaries of the possible. We will consider your proposal, Dr. Thorne, Kale said, his tone softening slightly. But do not mistake our caution for weakness. We will be watching you closely. The meeting ended on an uneasy note, a fragile truce hanging in the balance. Thorn and Anya returned to Cestus Roman III, their hearts heavy with a weight of responsibility. They knew that the coming weeks would be crucial. They had to convince the Arcturians, not just with words, but with actions, that their technology was a force for good. Back on the colony, the atmosphere was tense but determined. The colonists rallied around Thorn and Anya, their trust in their leaders solidified by the successful reign. They knew the stakes were high but they were ready to fight for their future. Thorne and Anya threw themselves into their work, expanding the Tempest engine network, refining its algorithms, and collecting data to prove its long-term efficacy. They also initiated outreach programs, educating the colonists about the technology and its potential benefits, ensuring that everyone understood the importance of their collective effort. As the Archerian scientists arrived on Cestus Roman III, a new chapter in the colony's history began, a chapter filled with uncertainty, conflict, and the potential for unprecedented collaboration. The Arcturian delegation, led by Dr. Alada, a renowned xenobiologist, arrived with an air of both curiosity and apprehension. Alada, unlike Kale, possessed a genuine thirst for knowledge and an open mind, though her loyalty to the Empire was unwavering. Thorne and Anya greeted them at the spaceport, a carefully choreographed display of hospitality and cooperation. As they exchanged pleasantries, Thorne couldn't help but notice the subtle tension in Alara's eyes, a mixture of skepticism and fascination. Doctor, Thorne Alara said, her voice a melodious chime. Your work has certainly captured the Council's attention. We are eager to learn more about this. Tempest Engine. The pleasure is ours, Doctor. Ilara, Thorne replied, a polite smile gracing her lips. We are confident that you will find our research both rigorous and groundbreaking. The Arcturians were given a tour of the colony, their multi-lensed eyes taking in every detail. They visited the agricultural fields, now flourishing with vibrant crops, the newly established settlements, 
and the sprawling network of Tempest engine nodes. They questioned the colonists, their inquiries probing and insightful, revealing a deep understanding of ecological systems and a keen interest in the long-term effects of the weather manipulation. Thorn, acting as their guide, answered their questions with patience and clarity, eager to showcase the positive impact of their technology. She demonstrated how the engine could not only regulate rainfall and temperature, but also mitigate natural disasters like dust storms and flash floods. She even showed them the data collected by the engine sensors, a wealth of information about the planet's atmosphere and its intricate interactions with the Cestus Pulse. Alara, initially reserved, gradually warmed to Thorne's passion and expertise. She was intrigued by the concept of the Cestus Pulse, a phenomenon unlike anything she had encountered before. She began to ask more probing questions, delving into the theoretical underpinnings of Thorne's research and the potential applications of the technology. Anya, observing from a distance, felt a glimmer of hope. Perhaps Ilara, with her scientific curiosity and open mind, could be swayed. Perhaps she could see beyond the political posturing and recognize the genuine value of what they had achieved. As the days turned into weeks, the Archerian delegation's skepticism slowly eroded, replaced by a grudging respect for human ingenuity. They began to collaborate with Thorne's team, sharing their own knowledge and expertise, their conversations growing increasingly animated and productive. A subtle shift occurred, a thawing of the icy relations between humans and Archerians. It was a small step, a tentative bridge built on a foundation of mutual curiosity and a shared desire to understand the mysteries of this strange new world. But it was a step in the right direction, a step towards a future where cooperation, not conflict, would define their relationship. The collaboration between the human and Archerian scientists proved to be fruitful, a symphony of minds harmonizing to unlock the secrets of Cestus Roman III. Thorn and Alara, initially wary of each other, found common ground in their shared passion for knowledge and their fascination with the planet's unique meteorological phenomena. They spent countless hours together in the research station, poring over data, debating theories, and brainstorming new ideas. Their discussions were lively, sometimes heated, but always respectful. They challenged each other's assumptions, pushed the boundaries of their understanding, and gradually built a mutual trust that transcended their differing backgrounds and loyalties. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the research station's courtyard, Thorn and Alara found themselves alone in the lab. The air was thick with the hum of instruments and the faint scent of ozone. You know, Ilara said, her voice barely above a whisper, I never expected to find a kindred spirit on this backwater planet. Thorn looked up from her data pad, surprised by the Arcturian's candidness. Nor did I, she admitted, a smile playing on her lips. But I'm glad I did. Alara returned her smile, a warmth in her eyes that Thorn had never seen before. I must confess, she continued, I initially came here with a great deal of skepticism. I thought your claims of weather control were exaggerated, to say the least. Thorn chuckled. I can't say I blame you. It does sound a bit far-fetched, doesn't it? Indeed, Ilara agreed. But I have seen with my own eyes the results of your work. The data is undeniable. You have achieved something remarkable, Dr. Thorn. Thorn felt a surge of pride, not just for herself, but for her entire team. It wasn't just me, Dr. Ilara. It was a collective effort, a testament to human ingenuity and perseverance. Allah nodded, her respect for Thorn growing with each passing day. Perhaps, she mused, we have underestimated humanity. Perhaps you are not as primitive as we thought. Thorn leaned forward, her eyes sparkling with a mischievous glint. Perhaps, she said, her voice barely a whisper, we are more than you ever imagined. Their conversation drifted into the night, the two scientists sharing stories of their lives, their research, their dreams. A bond was forged, a connection that transcended species and politics. The next morning, Thorne and Alora presented their findings to the rest of the team. The Arctrians, though still cautious, were now more receptive to the idea of weather control. 
They acknowledged the potential benefits and expressed a willingness to continue collaborating with the humans. Anya, witnessing this newfound camaraderie, felt a surge of hope. Perhaps this crisis, this clash of cultures and technologies, could ultimately lead to something positive. Perhaps it could pave the way for a future where humans and Arcturians work together, not as rivals, but as partners exploring the universe and unlocking its secrets side by side. The weeks that followed were a whirlwind of scientific discovery and diplomatic maneuvering. Thorne and Alara's team delved deeper into the mysteries of the Cestus Pulse, their research revealing its far-reaching influence on the planet's ecosystem. They discovered that the pulse not only affected the weather, but also interacted with the planet's flora and fauna, influencing their growth, behavior, and even evolution. This revelation raised new questions and ethical concerns. Could the Tempest engine, designed to control the weather, also be used to manipulate the planet's life forms? Was it ethical to interfere with the natural processes of evolution? These questions sparked intense debates among the scientists, their discussions often extending late into the night. Meanwhile, Anya worked tirelessly on the diplomatic front. She maintained open communication with the Arcturian Council, providing regular updates on the research progress and the colony's overall stability. She also reached out to other alien species represented on the Council, seeking to build alliances and garner support for the human cause. Her efforts were not in vain. Many of the Council members, intrigued by the potential of the Tempest engine and impressed by humanity's resilience, began to express reservations about the Arcturian Empire's hardline stance. They questioned the ethics of denying a struggling colony access to life-saving technology and argued for a more cooperative approach. Kale, sensing a shift in the political winds, grew increasingly agitated. He accused the humans of manipulating the Council and spreading misinformation. He even threatened to withdraw the Arcturian delegation from Cestus Roman III, a move that would further isolate the colony and jeopardize its future. Thorne and Anya, however, remained undeterred. They knew they had the truth on their side, and they were determined to fight for their right to use the Tempest engine for the betterment of their colony. One evening, as Thorne and Alara were working late in the lab, a message arrived from Anya. Her voice was urgent, her tone grave. Thorne, Ilara, she said, her image flickering on the holographic projector. We have a problem. Kale has convinced the Council to issue a cease and desist order. They're giving us one week to shut down the Tempest engine, or they'll take action. Thorne and Alara exchanged a look of dismay. This was a major setback, a potential death knell for their project and the colony's future. But they refused to give up. We have to fight this, Anya, Thorne said, her voice filled with resolve. We can't let them take away our only hope for survival. Elara nodded in agreement. We will not go down without a fight, she said, her voice echoing Thorne's determination. We will stand together, humans and Arcturians, united in our pursuit of knowledge and progress. As the deadline loomed, the colony braced itself for the impending showdown. The fate of humanity on Cestus Roman III hung in the balance, and the world held its breath. The news of the Council's order swept through the colony like a cold front. Fear mingled with defiance, creating a palpable tension in the air. Farmers worried about their crops, miners feared for their livelihoods, and families huddled together, wondering what the future held. In the research station, Thorne and Alara paced the lab, their faces etched with concern. We can't let them shut us down, Thorne insisted, her voice a mix of frustration and determination. Not when we're so close to proving the long-term benefits of the engine. I agree, Alara chimed in, her archery and composure cracking slightly. But we must tread carefully. Defying the Council openly could have dire consequences. Anya joined them, her face drawn with worry. I've been in contact with our allies on the Council, she reported. They're trying to buy us more time, but Kale's influence is strong. He's painted us as reckless and irresponsible, a danger to the entire planet. Thorne slammed her fist on the table, her eyes flashing with anger. He's a pompous, self-righteous hypocrite. He doesn't care about this planet or its people. 
He just wants to maintain the Empire's control. Elara placed a calming hand on Thorne's shoulder. I understand your frustration, Dr. Thorne, but we must not let emotions cloud our judgment. We need a plan, a strategy that will both appease the Council and protect our interests. Anya nodded in agreement. We need to show them that the Tempest Engine is not a threat, but a solution. We need to demonstrate its potential to not only improve our lives, but also contribute to the greater good of the galaxy. Thorne's eyes lit up, a spark of inspiration igniting in her mind. What if we invite the Council to Cestus Roman III, she proposed. Let them see firsthand what we've achieved. Let them experience the benefits of a stable climate, the abundance of our crops, the improved quality of life for our people. Anya and Alara exchanged a look, a silent conversation passing between them. It was a risky move, a gamble that could either win the Council's favor or backfire spectacularly. But it was also their best chance to turn the tide, to show the Arcturians that humanity was not a threat, but a potential partner. It's worth a try, Anya finally said, her voice firm. I'll contact our allies on the Council and see if we can arrange a visit. In the meantime, we need to make sure the colony is in pristine condition. We need to showcase our achievements and prove that we are worthy of their trust. The three scientists, united by a common purpose, set to work. They rallied the colonists, inspiring them with their vision of a prosperous future. They worked tirelessly to optimize the Tempest engine, ensuring its performance was flawless, and they prepared to welcome the Arcturians to Cestus Roman III, hoping to change their minds and secure the future of their colony. The colony transformed into a showcase of human ingenuity and resilience. The once dusty streets were swept clean, the buildings repainted, and the fields meticulously groomed. Every detail, from the neatly arranged hydroponic gardens to the polished solar panels, was designed to impress the Arcturian delegation. Thorne and her team worked tirelessly to prepare a comprehensive presentation, showcasing the data, models, and simulations that supported their claims of the Tempest engine's efficacy and safety. They even created a holographic tour of the colony, highlighting the improvements in agriculture, infrastructure, and overall quality of life. Anya, meanwhile, focused on the diplomatic aspect. She reached out to her contacts within the Council, urging them to keep an open mind and consider the potential benefits of the technology. She also organized a series of cultural events, showcasing the diverse talents and traditions of the colonists hoping to create a positive impression on their visitors. When the Arcturian delegation arrived, they were greeted with a warm welcome, a far cry from the tense atmosphere of their previous visit. The colonists, dressed in their finest attire, lined the streets, waving banners and cheering as the Arcturian's sleek transport glided through the air. The delegation, led by Councillor Lyra, a respected diplomat known for her fairness and pragmatism, seemed genuinely surprised by the transformation. They marveled at the lush fields, the thriving livestock, and the vibrant community spirit. Thorne and Anya escorted them to the research station, where a holographic display of the Tempest engine awaited them. Thorne, her nerves tingling with anticipation, began her presentation, her voice steady and confident. She explained the science behind the engine, the intricate workings of the Cestus Pulse, and the meticulous calculations that guided their weather manipulation efforts. She showed them the data, the graphs, the projections, all pointing to a future where Cestus Roman III was a thriving, self-sufficient colony, a testament to human ingenuity and adaptability. The Arcturians listened intently, their faces a mask of concentration. They asked questions, probing for weaknesses, seeking to uncover any hidden dangers, Thorne answered them all with honesty and transparency, her confidence bolstered by the overwhelming evidence of their success. Anya then took the stage, her military bearing giving her words an added weight. She spoke of the colony's struggles, the sacrifices they had made, and the unwavering determination that had brought them to this point. She appealed to the Arcturians' sense of fairness and compassion, urging them to see the humans not as a threat, but as potential partners in the grand endeavor of galactic exploration and colonization. As the presentation concluded, a hush fell over the room. 
the Archerians exchanged glances, their expressions a mix of surprise, admiration, and perhaps a hint of shame. Counselor Lyra, breaking the silence, rose to her feet, her eyes fixed on Thorn and Anya. We have seen and heard much today, she said, her voice soft but resonant. And I must say, we are impressed. Lyra's words hung in the air, a pregnant pause that seemed to stretch on for an eternity. Thorn and Anya held their breath, their hearts pounding in their chests. The fate of their colony, their dreams, their very lives, seemed to hinge on the Archerians' next words. We acknowledge, Lyra continued, her voice carefully measured, that our initial assessment of the situation was incomplete. We underestimated your ingenuity and your resourcefulness. A collective sigh of relief swept through the room. The colonists exchanged hopeful glances, their spirits lifting. Thorn and Anya shared a discreet smile, a silent acknowledgement of their hard-fought victory. However, Lyra added, her tone shifting, we still have concerns about the long-term effects of your technology on the planet's ecosystem. We cannot ignore the potential for unforeseen consequences. The mood in the room sobered. The Arcturians were not entirely convinced, their caution a reminder of the delicate balance they sought to maintain. Thorne stepped forward, her voice unwavering. We understand your concerns, Counselor Lyra. We are not blind to the potential risks. But we believe that, with proper monitoring and regulation, we can mitigate those risks and ensure that the Tempest engine benefits not only us, but also the planet and its inhabitants. She presented a detailed plan for ongoing research and monitoring, say, outlining the measures they had put in place to safeguard the environment and ensure the sustainable use of the technology. She emphasized their willingness to collaborate with Archerian scientists to share data and knowledge and to work together to create a prosperous future for both species. Lyra listened attentively, nodding occasionally in acknowledgement. When Thorne finished, she addressed the council, her voice resonating with authority. My fellow council members, she said, we have a difficult decision to make. The humans have demonstrated remarkable ingenuity and resilience. Their technology has the potential to transform this planet and improve the lives of countless beings, but we cannot ignore the risks. We must proceed with caution, guided by wisdom and a deep respect for the natural world. A hush fell over the room as the council members deliberated. The air crackled with unspoken tensions, the weight of the decision pressing down on them. After what seemed like an eternity, Lyra spoke again. The council has reached a decision, she announced. We will not shut down the Tempest engine. However, we will impose strict regulations on its use and establish a joint oversight committee to monitor its impact on the environment. We will also require the humans to share their research and technology with the Arcturian Empire in the spirit of cooperation and mutual benefit. A wave of jubilation washed over Thorn and Anya. They had done it. They had convinced the Arcturians to give them a chance. They had secured the future of their colony, not through defiance, but through diplomacy, collaboration, and a shared vision of a brighter future. The colony, once a beacon of hope, was now a powder keg of tension. The Arcturian presence, while officially for collaboration, felt like an occupation. Their sleek ships hovered ominously in the sky, their scientists meticulously scrutinizing every aspect of the Tempest engine and its effects. Thorne found herself under a microscope, her every move watched, her every word scrutinized. Alora, though sympathetic to Thorne's predicament, was torn between her loyalty to the Empire and her growing admiration for the human scientist. She found herself increasingly drawn to Thorne's passion and determination, her unwavering belief in the potential of their shared project. One evening, as Thorne was working late in the lab, Elora approached her, a hesitant look on her face. Dr. Thorne, she began, her voice barely a whisper. May I speak with you in private? Thorne, surprised by the request, nodded and led Alara to a secluded corner of the lab. Alara took a deep breath, her eyes filled with a troubled light. I... I have a confession to make, she said, her voice barely audible. I have been sending reports to the Council that are... less than accurate. Thorne's heart skipped a beat. 
What do you mean? she asked, her voice a mix of curiosity and apprehension. Elara hesitated, as if choosing her words carefully. I have been omitting certain details, downplaying the positive effects of the Tempest engine, and emphasizing the potential risks. Thorn felt a surge of anger, but it quickly subsided, replaced by a sense of understanding. She knew Alara was caught between a rock and a hard place, torn between her duty to the Empire and her growing belief in the human cause. Why are you telling me this? Thorn asked, her voice soft. Alara looked directly into Thorn's eyes her own filled with a mixture of guilt and hope. Because I believe in what you are doing, she said. I believe that the Tempest engine has the potential to change the galaxy for the better, and I cannot stand by and let it be destroyed by fear and prejudice. Thorn was speechless. She had never expected this, a confession of faith from an Arcturian scientist, a potential ally in the heart of the enemy camp. What can we do? she asked her voice barely a whisper. Alara's lips curled into a faint smile. We can change the narrative, she said. We can show the Council the truth, the full picture. We can present them with undeniable evidence of the engine's benefits, not just for this colony, but for the entire galaxy. Thorn reached out and clasped Alara's hand, a silent gesture of solidarity. We'll do it together, she said, her voice filled with renewed determination. We'll show them the truth, even if it means risking everything. The clandestine alliance between Thorn and Alara deepened, fueled by shared purpose and a growing mutual respect. They met in secret, away from the prying eyes of the Arcturian delegation and the watchful gaze of the colony's security forces. They shared data, debated strategies, and plotted their next move. We need to focus on the long-term benefits, Alara stressed during one of their clandestine meetings. The Council is obsessed with immediate results, with short-term stability. We need to show them that the Tempest engine can not only mitigate the current weather patterns, but also fundamentally improve the planet's ecosystem over time. Thorn nodded in agreement. We need to make them understand that Cestus Roman III is not just a resource to be exploited, but a living, breathing entity that deserves our respect and care. They decided to focus their efforts on a particularly ambitious project, terraforming a barren region of the planet, a vast expanse of rock and sand that had resisted all previous attempts at cultivation. They hypothesized that by carefully manipulating the Cestus Pulse, they could induce rainfall, stimulate soil formation, and create a fertile oasis in the heart of the desert. It was a risky endeavor, a gamble that could either cement their case or expose them to further scrutiny. But Thorn and Alara were confident in their calculations, their faith in each other's expertise a source of unwavering strength. They worked tirelessly, drawing upon their combined knowledge of xenobiology, meteorology, and engineering. They designed a specialized array of Tempest engine nodes, calibrated to interact with the unique geological and atmospheric conditions of the desert region. They monitored every detail, every fluctuation in the energy patterns, every subtle shift in the wind's direction. Weeks turned into months, and the desert slowly began to transform. The first signs were subtle, a softening of the sand, a hint of moisture in the air, a few hardy plants poking through the cracks in the rock. But gradually, the changes became more pronounced. The soil deepened, the vegetation spread, and the once barren landscape came alive with a riot of color. One morning, as the sun rose over the newly formed oasis, Thorn and Alara stood side by side, their hands clasped, their hearts filled with a quiet joy. They had created something beautiful, something meaningful, a testament to their shared vision and their unwavering belief in the power of science to heal and transform. The terraformed oasis became a symbol of hope for the colony, a beacon of human ingenuity and Arcturian collaboration. It was a living proof that the Tempest engine was not a threat, but a tool for progress, a key to unlocking the planet's full potential. The Arcturian Council, faced with this undeniable evidence, could no longer ignore the truth. They were forced to acknowledge the success of the human project and reconsider their stance on weather control. A wave of change swept over Cestus Roman III in the months that followed. 
the archery and council, swayed by the evidence and the growing support for the humans within their ranks, officially sanctioned the continued use of the Tempest engine. The Joint Oversight Committee, now a platform for genuine collaboration, worked diligently to refine the technology and expand its applications. The colony flourished under the newly stable climate. Crops thrived, yielding abundant harvests that not only sustained the colonists, but also opened up trade opportunities with other worlds. New settlements sprung up, their architecture blending human practicality with archery and aesthetics. The once barren landscape transformed into a patchwork of verdant fields, sparkling lakes, and bustling cities. Thorn and Alara's bond deepened, their shared passion for science transcending the barriers of species and culture. They became inseparable, their conversations ranging from complex theoretical physics to the simple joys of watching the sunset over the newly formed oasis. Anya, witnessing their growing closeness, felt a pang of bittersweet happiness. She had always admired Thorne's brilliance and determination, and she was glad that she had found someone who truly understood and appreciated her. Anya herself had also found a connection with a member of the Arcturian delegation a young engineer named Tolan, whose quiet intelligence and gentle humor resonated with her. The colony's success, however, was not without its challenges. The Arcturians, though officially supportive, remained cautious. They monitored the Tempest engine's every operation, scrutinizing its data and conducting regular environmental assessments. They also maintained a discreet military presence on the planet, a reminder of their power and their lingering suspicions. Thorn, aware of the delicate balance of their situation, tread carefully. She shared her research openly, inviting the Arcturians to participate in every aspect of the project. She also established strict protocols for the use of the Tempest engine, ensuring that it was used responsibly and sustainably. Despite the challenges, the colony thrived. The humans, once viewed as underdogs, had proven their worth. They had tamed a wild planet, harnessed its power, and created a haven for their species. They had earned the respect of the Arcturians, not through force or intimidation, but through ingenuity, perseverance, and a willingness to collaborate. The story of Cestus Roman III became a legend, a tale whispered in the corridors of power across the galaxy. It was a story of human resilience, Arcturian pragmatism, and the transformative power of science. It was a story that inspired hope, challenged preconceived notions, and opened up new possibilities for interspecies cooperation and understanding. As the colony thrived, so too did the relationship between Thorn and Alara. Their bond, forged in the crucible of scientific collaboration and shared adversity, blossomed into a deep and abiding love. It was a love that defied the boundaries of species and challenged the preconceived notions of both humans and Arcturians. Their romance was not without its challenges, there were cultural differences to navigate, language barriers to overcome, and the ever-present scrutiny of the Arcturian Council. But their love was strong, their connection undeniable. They found solace and strength in each other's arms, a refuge from the pressures of their work and the uncertainty of their future. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky with hues of orange and purple, Thorn and Alara found themselves alone in the newly christened Verdant Valley, the once barren desert now transformed into a lush oasis. They sat on a grassy knoll, the gentle murmur of a nearby stream providing a soothing soundtrack. This is beautiful, Alara whispered, her multifaceted eyes reflecting the vibrant colors of the sunset. I never thought I would see such a transformation in my lifetime. Thorn smiled her hand reaching out to caress Ilara's shimmering scales. It's a testament to the power of collaboration, she said, to the potential for two different species to work together, to learn from each other, and to create something truly extraordinary. Ilara turned to face Thorn, her gaze intense. You have changed me, Eris, she said, using Thorn's first name for the first time. You have shown me that there is more to the universe than logic and reason. There is also beauty, passion, and the undeniable power of the human spirit. Thorne's heart swelled with emotion. She had never felt so seen, so understood, by anyone before. And you have shown me, she replied, her voice thick with emotion, 
that the Arcturians are not just cold, calculating beings. You are capable of empathy, compassion, and even love. They leaned towards each other, their lips meeting in a tender kiss. It was a kiss that transcended species, a symbol of their shared humanity, their shared love for knowledge, and their shared hope for a brighter future. Their love story, whispered throughout the colony, became a symbol of unity and hope. It was a reminder that even in the face of adversity, even in the most unlikely of circumstances, love could bloom, bridging the gap between different worlds and different species. News of their relationship reached the Arcturian Council, causing a stir among the conservative factions. But Councillor Lyra, ever the pragmatist, saw it as an opportunity to further strengthen the ties between humans and Arcturians. She publicly congratulated Thorn and Alara, hailing their union as a testament to the power of love to overcome even the most entrenched prejudices. The colony, once a battleground for control, was now a melting pot of cultures, a place where humans and Arcturians lived, worked, and loved side by side. The Tempest Engine, once a source of conflict, had become a symbol of unity, a testament to the power of science to not only transform the world, but also the hearts and minds of its inhabitants. The thawing of relations between the humans and Arcturians extended beyond the scientific sphere. The once segregated communities began to mingle, their initial curiosity and apprehension giving way to a shared appreciation for each other's cultures and customs. The colony's marketplace, once a predominantly human affair, now bustled with Arcturian traders, their stalls laden with exotic goods from across the galaxy. The scent of spiced delicacies mingled with the aroma of freshly baked bread, creating a tantalizing symphony of smells. Human children, their eyes wide with wonder, gazed at the strange and beautiful creatures browsing the wares, while Arcturian younglings, their scales shimmering in the sunlight, shyly offered handmade trinkets in exchange for human sweets. Cultural exchange programs flourished, fostering understanding and appreciation. Arcturian musicians performed alongside human dancers, their melodies and movements blending into a harmonious expression of shared joy. Human artists created intricate sculptures inspired by Arcturian mythology, while Arcturian poets composed odes to the resilience and ingenuity of their newfound allies. Even the once rigid social barriers began to crumble. Romantic relationships blossomed between humans and Arcturians, a testament to the power of love to transcend differences. Mixed families emerged, their children a testament to the growing unity between the two species. One warm evening, a grand feast was held in the Verdant Valley, a celebration of the colony's achievements and the newfound harmony between its inhabitants. Humans and Arcturians dined together, their laughter echoing through the once barren landscape. Thorn and Alada, the unofficial ambassadors of this burgeoning alliance, sat side by side, their hands intertwined. They watched as human children played tag with Arcturian younglings, their laughter a sweet melody that filled the air. Look at them, Alara whispered, her voice filled with wonder. They see no difference, no barriers. They only see friends, playmates, fellow explorers of this new world. Thorn nodded, her heart swelling with pride and hope. They are the future, she said, her gaze sweeping across the joyous scene. A future where humans and Arcturians live not as rivals, but as equals, united in our shared quest for knowledge and understanding. As the festivities continued late into the night, Thorn and Alara stole away from the crowd, seeking a moment of solitude under the star-strewn sky. They walked hand in hand through the lush fields, their footsteps barely disturbing the tranquil silence. They reached the edge of a cliff overlooking the valley, a breathtaking panorama of natural beauty and human ingenuity. Thorn leaned against Alara, her head resting on the Arcturian's shoulder. We've come a long way, haven't we? She murmured, her voice barely audible over the gentle rustle of the leaves. Alan nodded, her scales shimmering in the moonlight. Indeed, we have, she replied, her voice a soft chime, and the journey has only just begun. The newfound peace on Cestus Roman III did not go unnoticed in the wider galactic community. News of humanity's remarkable achievements spread far and wide, carried by traders, diplomats, and the ever-present information networks that crisscrossed the stars. 
other species, long accustomed to viewing humans as a fledgling race struggling to find their place in the universe, were forced to reassess their assumptions. The Arcturian Empire, once the unchallenged hegemon of the Interstellar Council, found its authority subtly undermined. Delegations from various planets began arriving on Cestus Roman III, eager to witness the miracle of the Tempest Engine and learn from its creators. Thorn and Alara, now renowned figures in the scientific community, became sought after speakers and advisors, their expertise sought by governments and corporations alike. The colony, once an isolated outpost, was now a hub of interstellar activity. Its spaceport bustled with ships of all shapes and sizes, their crews representing a dazzling array of cultures and species. The marketplace, already a vibrant center of trade, expanded further, its stalls overflowing with exotic goods from across the galaxy. The influx of new ideas and perspectives enriched the colony's intellectual and cultural life. Universities were established, research institutes founded, and artistic movements flourished. Cestus Roman III, once a symbol of human struggle, had become a beacon of progress and innovation, a shining example of what could be achieved through cooperation and understanding. But even as the colony basked in its newfound glory, challenges remained. The Arcturian Empire, though publicly supportive of the human project, still harbored reservations. They watched the colony's every move with a wary eye, their scientists meticulously monitoring the Tempest engine's effects on the planet's ecosystem. Thorn and Alara, aware of the Arcturian's lingering doubts, continued their research with renewed vigor. They sought to not only refine the Tempest engine, but also to develop new technologies that could address the planet's remaining challenges, such as the scarcity of certain resources and the threat of seismic activity. Their work, however, was not without its critics. Some human colonists, emboldened by their recent success, grew impatient with the Arcturian oversight. They argued for greater autonomy, for the freedom to use the Tempest engine without interference. Others, more cautious, worried about the long-term consequences of manipulating nature on such a grand scale. Anya, now the de facto leader of the colony, found herself caught between these conflicting viewpoints. She understood the desire for independence, the yearning to chart their own course. But she also recognized the importance of maintaining a good relationship with the Arcturians, whose technological prowess and political influence were still crucial to the colony's survival. As the colony grappled with these growing pains, a new threat emerged, one that would test the strength of their newfound unity and the resilience of their technological achievements. A distress signal, piercing the calm of the colony's calm channels, shattered the illusion of peace. The message, garbled and panicked, originated from a remote research outpost nestled in the northern mountains. It spoke of a sudden, catastrophic weather event, an anomaly unlike anything they had ever witnessed. Anya immediately dispatched a search and rescue team, led by Captain Idris, a seasoned veteran known for his courage and resourcefulness. Thorn and Alara, their scientific curiosity piqued, insisted on accompanying the team, their knowledge of the planet's weather patterns potentially crucial to understanding the unfolding crisis. Upon arrival at the outpost, they were greeted by a scene of devastation. The once pristine facility was in ruins, its structures twisted and battered, its equipment scattered across the landscape. The air crackled with a strange energy, a palpable tension that sent shivers down their spines. The survivors, a handful of haggard scientists and technicians, recounted their harrowing ordeal. A massive, swirling vortex of energy had descended from the sky, unleashing a fury of winds, lightning, and torrential rain. The storm, unlike any natural phenomenon, had a malevolent sentience, a destructive intelligence that seemed to target the outpost with ruthless precision. Thorn and Alara exchanged a worried glance. This was no ordinary weather event, no freak accident of nature. This was something else, something far more sinister. They immediately began collecting data, their sensors picking up a chaotic jumble of energy readings that defied explanation. The Cestus Pulse, normally a harmonious symphony of energy, was now a discordant cacophony, its patterns erratic and unpredictable. What could have caused this, Ilara asked, her voice laced with concern. Thorn shook her head, 
her brow furrowed in concentration. I don't know, she admitted, but it's not natural. Something, or someone, is interfering with the pulse. A chilling realization dawned upon them. Could this be the work of the Arcturians? Were they testing the limits of the Tempest engine, trying to sabotage their efforts? Or was there another, more sinister force at play, an unknown entity that sought to destabilize the planet and exploit its power? As they pondered these questions, a new anomaly appeared on their sensors, a massive energy spike emanating from the heart of the northern mountains, it was a signal, a beacon, drawing them towards its source. Anya, sensing the gravity of the situation, ordered the team to proceed with caution. They ventured deeper into the mountains, the landscape growing increasingly hostile, the air thick with a foreboding energy. They reached a narrow pass, a natural gateway to a hidden valley. As they emerged from the pass, they gasped in astonishment. Before them lay a colossal structure, a towering edifice of alien design, its surface shimmering with an otherworldly light. Thorn and Elia exchanged a look of awe and apprehension. They had stumbled upon something far greater than they had ever imagined, a mystery that could threaten the very existence of their colony. The structure, an imposing monolith of gleaming metal and pulsating energy fields, seemed to defy gravity, its apex disappearing into the cloud-laden sky. The air around it thrummed with an otherworldly hum, a resonance that seemed to seep into their bones. Thorn and Alara, their scientific instincts overriding their caution, approached the structure with a mix of awe and trepidation. The closer they got, the more intricate the details became, glowing glyphs etched into the surface, pulsating energy conduits snaking across its facade, and a massive central portal that seemed to beckon them closer. Incredible, Alara whispered her eyes wide with wonder. I've never seen anything like it. This technology is far beyond anything the Arcturians possess. Thorn nodded, her mind racing to make sense of the data streaming in from her handheld scanner. It's not just advanced, she said, her voice hushed. It's alive. It's interacting with the Cestus pulse, amplifying its power, twisting it into something unnatural. Suddenly, the portal flared with light and a beam of pure energy shot out, momentarily blinding them. When their vision cleared, they saw a figure standing in the doorway, a silhouette wreathed in shimmering light. Welcome, travelers, a voice echoed through their minds, a telepathic intrusion that sent chills down their spines. I have been expecting you. The figure stepped forward, revealing itself to be a humanoid form, but one that defied easy categorization, its skin was a shifting tapestry of colors, its eyes glowed with an inner light, and its body seemed to radiate a palpable aura of power. I am Sentinel, the being said, its voice resonating with an otherworldly authority. I am the guardian of this planet, and I have been watching you with great interest. Thorn and Alara exchanged a nervous glance. They had stumbled upon something far beyond their understanding, a being of immense power and enigmatic motives. What do you want? Anya asked, her voice steady despite her racing heart. Sentinel raised a hand, its fingers tracing the air as if painting an invisible picture. I seek balance, it said. This planet is out of balance, its natural rhythms disrupted by your reckless interference. Thorn bristled at the accusation. We are not reckless, she retorted. We are trying to heal this planet, to make it habitable for all species. Sentinel tilted its head, its eyes glowing with an intensity that made Thorn's skin crawl. Your intentions may be noble, it said, but your methods are flawed. You cannot control the Cestus Pulse. It is a force far greater than you comprehend. Anya stepped forward, her gaze unwavering. We are not trying to control it, she said. We are trying to understand it, to work with it to create a harmonious coexistence between technology and nature. Sentinel's lips curled into a faint smile. Perhaps, it said, its voice laced with a hint of amusement. But first, you must prove your worth. A tense silence hung in the air. Thorn and Alara exchanged a worried glance. What did Sentinel mean? What kind of test awaited them? The tension hung heavy in the air as Sentinel's words echoed through the valley. 
Thorne and Alara exchanged a look, a silent conversation passing between them. Anya, ever the pragmatist, stepped forward, her voice steady despite the surreal situation. We are willing to prove our worth, she declared, her gaze meeting Sentinel's unwavering stare. But what kind of test do you propose? Sentinel's lips curled into an enigmatic smile, its form shimmering as if composed of starlight. The test is simple, it intoned, its voice a melody that resonated with the very essence of Cestus Roman III. Restore the balance you have disrupted. Heal the wounds you have inflicted upon this planet. Thorn's brow furrowed, a wave of confusion washing over her. But the Tempest Engine has improved the planet's condition, she protested. We have brought rain to the deserts, stabilized the climate, and fostered a thriving ecosystem. Sentinel raised a hand, its fingers tracing intricate patterns in the air. You have merely masked the symptoms, not cured the disease. The Cestus Pulse is not a force to be controlled, but a symphony to be understood. Your technology has disrupted its harmony, creating a dissonance that threatens to unravel the delicate balance of this world. Thorn and Alara exchanged a troubled glance. Sentinel's words, though cryptic, resonated with an undeniable truth. They had focused on harnessing the pulse's power, but had they truly understood its deeper meaning, its connection to the very soul of the planet? We are willing to learn, Elara spoke up, her voice a gentle chime. We seek knowledge, not domination. Guide us, Sentinel, and we will strive to restore the harmony we have disrupted. Sentinel's eyes softened, a flicker of approval in their depths. Very well, it said, I will show you the path. But be warned, the journey will be perilous, and the cost of failure may be greater than you can bear. With a wave of its hand, Sentinel conjured a swirling vortex of light, a portal that seemed to lead to another dimension. Follow me, it beckoned, its voice echoing with an irresistible allure. Thorn and Alara, their hearts pounding with a mixture of fear and excitement, exchanged a determined look. They had come this far, faced countless challenges, and emerged stronger each time. They would not falter now. They stepped through the portal, leaving behind the familiar world of Cestus Roman III and venturing into the unknown. The fate of their colony, their relationship, and the very balance of the planet hung in the balance as they embarked on this perilous quest to restore the harmony they had unwittingly disrupted. The portal deposited them into a realm unlike anything they had ever encountered, it was a dreamscape of swirling colors, ethereal lights, and shifting geometric patterns. The air thrummed with a symphony of unseen energies, a harmonious chorus that resonated with their very souls. Sentinel appeared before them, its form shimmering like a mirage. Welcome to the Nexus, it said, its voice echoing in the vast expanse. This is the heart of Cestus Roman III, the nexus of its energies, the repository of its memories. Thorn and Alara gazed around in wonder, their senses overwhelmed by the sheer beauty and complexity of the place. They felt a profound connection to the planet, as if they were standing within its very soul. What is this place? Thorn asked, her voice hushed with reverence. This is where the Cestus Pulse originates, Sentinel explained. It is the source of the planet's life force, the wellspring of its power. It is also the key to understanding the true nature of this world. Sentinel led them deeper into the Nexus, their path illuminated by the pulsating energy fields that surrounded them. They passed through shimmering curtains of light, their bodies tingling with an otherworldly energy. They came to a vast chamber, its walls adorned with glowing glyphs and intricate patterns. In the center of the chamber stood a crystal monolith, its facets shimmering with a rainbow of colors. This is the heartstone, Sentinel said, its voice filled with reverence. It is the core of the Cestus Pulse, the source of its power and wisdom. Thorn and Alara approached the heartstone, their hearts pounding with anticipation. They could feel the immense energy emanating from it, a symphony of vibrations that resonated with their own being. Sentinel gestured towards the heartstone. Touch it, it said. Open your minds and hearts to its wisdom. Thorn and Alara hesitated for a moment, then reached out their hands. As their fingers touched the smooth surface of the crystal, 
a surge of energy flowed through them, connecting them to the heartstone and, through it, to the very essence of Cestus Roman III. Images flashed through their minds, a kaleidoscope of memories and emotions. They saw the planet's birth, its tumultuous geological upheavals, the rise and fall of countless ecosystems, the slow dance of evolution. They felt the planet's joy, its pain, its resilience, its unwavering determination to survive and thrive. They also saw the impact of humanity's arrival, the scars left by their technology, the disruption of the natural rhythms. But they also saw the potential for healing, for collaboration, for a harmonious coexistence between humans and the planet. When the vision ended, Thorn and Alora were left breathless, their minds reeling with newfound understanding. They had glimpsed the true nature of Cestus Roman III, its interconnectedness, its fragility, and its immense potential. Sentinel approached them, its eyes glowing with approval. You have seen the truth, it said. Now, it is up to you to choose your path. Will you continue to exploit this planet, or will you work with it, to restore the balance you have disrupted? Thorn and Ilara emerged from the Nexus, their faces etched with a newfound understanding and a profound sense of responsibility. The experience had transformed them, opening their eyes to the interconnectedness of all things on Cestus Roman III and the delicate balance they had unwittingly disrupted. Back in the research station, they immediately convened a meeting with their team, both human and Archerian. They shared their vision of a new approach to weather control, one that prioritized harmony with the planet's natural rhythms rather than brute force manipulation. We cannot simply impose our will on this planet, Thorn explained, her voice resonating with newfound conviction. We must learn to listen to its voice, to understand its needs, and to work in partnership with its natural processes. Ilara, her shimmering scales reflecting the holographic displays, added, The Tempest Engine is a powerful tool, but it is not a magic wand. We must use it with wisdom and restraint, always mindful of the long-term consequences of our actions. The team listened intently, their initial skepticism giving way to a grudging respect for Thorn and Alara's newfound wisdom. They had witnessed firsthand the power of the Nexus, the interconnectedness of all life on Cestus Roman III, and they could not deny the truth of their leader's words. A new plan began to take shape, a collaborative effort that drew upon the expertise of both humans and Arcturians. They would not abandon the Tempest engine, but they would modify its algorithms, fine-tuning its operations to harmonize with the Cestus pulse. They would also initiate a series of ecological restoration projects, repairing the damage caused by their previous interventions and promoting the planet's natural biodiversity. The news of this shift in approach was met with mixed reactions on the colony. Some colonists, still harboring resentment towards the Arcturians, viewed it as a capitulation, a betrayal of human ingenuity. Others, more pragmatic, recognized the wisdom of cooperation and the potential for long-term sustainability. Anya, ever the diplomat, worked tirelessly to build consensus, to bridge the divide between the two factions. She organized community meetings, facilitated open discussions, and sought to address the concerns of both sides. She emphasized the importance of unity, reminding them that their survival depended on their ability to work together, not only with each other, but also with the planet itself. The Arcturian Council, initially wary of this new approach, gradually came to accept it. The data collected by the Joint Oversight Committee, combined with the evidence of the colony's thriving ecosystem, spoke for itself. The humans had proven their willingness to learn, to adapt, and to prioritize the long-term health of the planet over short-term gains. A new era of cooperation dawned on Cestus Roman III. Humans and Arcturians worked side by side, their scientific endeavors guided by a shared respect for the natural world. The Tempest Engine, once a symbol of human arrogance, became a tool for healing and restoration, a testament to the power of collaboration to overcome even the most daunting challenges. Years passed and Cestus Roman III flourished. The colony, once a struggling outpost, became a shining example of human Arcturian cooperation. Its cities, built in harmony with the environment, boasted verdant parks, bustling markets, and soaring towers of glass and metal. 
The fields, once barren and dust-ridden, were now a patchwork of vibrant crops, providing sustenance for the growing population. Thorn and Ilara's relationship deepened, their bonds strengthened by shared challenges and triumphs. They married in a ceremony that blended human and Arcturian traditions, a symbol of their love and the unity between their species. Their home, a cozy cottage nestled in the heart of the verdant valley, became a sanctuary for them, a place where they could escape the pressures of their work and simply be together. Their union, however, was not without its detractors. Some humans, still clinging to old prejudices, saw Alara as an outsider, an alien who had somehow ensnared their beloved leader. Some Arcturians, equally resistant to change, viewed Thorn as a corrupting influence, a reminder of their empire's perceived humiliation. But Thorn and Alara paid no heed to the naysayers. They were too busy building a future together, a future where humans and Arcturians could coexist peacefully, their differences a source of strength rather than division. Their work on the Tempest engine continued, their research leading to even more groundbreaking discoveries. They found that the Cestus pulse was not unique to this planet. It was a fundamental force of nature, a cosmic rhythm that permeated the universe. They theorized that by harnessing this pulse, they could not only control the weather, but also influence other natural phenomena, such as earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and even the flow of time itself. These revelations opened up a new chapter in human Arcturian collaboration. They established a joint research institute, a hub of scientific innovation where the brightest minds from both species worked together to unravel the mysteries of the Cestus Pulse and explore its potential applications. Their work, however, was not without controversy. The ethical implications of manipulating such fundamental forces were a source of heated debate, both within the colony and the wider galactic community. Some feared that this newfound power could be used for nefarious purposes, while others argued that it was humanity's destiny to become stewards of the universe, guiding its evolution and ensuring its survival. Thorn and Alada, acutely aware of these concerns, established strict ethical guidelines for their research. They vowed to use their knowledge responsibly to prioritize the well-being of the planet and its inhabitants above all else. They understood that the power they wielded was a double-edged sword capable of both creation and destruction. As they stood on the precipice of a new era, a future filled with both promise and peril, they knew that their journey was far from over. The challenges ahead were daunting, but they faced them with unwavering determination, their love for each other and their shared vision of a brighter future guiding their every step. A decade after the Arcturian arrival, Cestus Roman III was a beacon of prosperity. Lush fields stretched across the once barren plains, fed by carefully orchestrated rainfall and basking in the warmth of a sun whose harsh rays were now tempered by the tempest engine. The human population had tripled, bolstered by a steady influx of immigrants eager to share in the planet's newfound bounty. The Research Institute, a sprawling complex of gleaming towers and sprawling laboratories, hummed with activity. Scientists from across the galaxy flocked to Cestus Roman III, drawn by the promise of groundbreaking discoveries and the opportunity to work alongside the legendary Dr. Thorne and Dr. Ilara. The pair, now a renowned power couple, had become synonymous with the colony's success. Their marriage, a symbol of unity and collaboration, had paved the way for countless other interspecies relationships, creating a truly multicultural society. One day, as Thorne and Alara were reviewing the latest data from the Tempest engine, a young Arcturian researcher burst into their office, his scales shimmering with excitement. Doctors, you need to see this, he exclaimed, his voice barely containing his enthusiasm. We've detected a new energy pattern, something extraordinary. Thorne and Alara exchanged a curious glance and followed the young researcher to the main control room. A holographic display filled the room, depicting a swirling vortex of energy, pulsating with a vibrant intensity. This pattern originated from deep within the planet's core, the researcher explained. It's unlike anything we've ever seen before. It's evolving. Thorne's eyes widened as she studied the display. The energy pattern was indeed unique, its complexity and dynamism surpassing even the Cestus Pulse. 
it seemed to possess a sentience, a will of its own, as it interacted with the planet's core, subtly influencing its geological processes. Elada, her scientific curiosity piqued, leaned closer, her eyes scanning the data streams flowing across her augmented vision. Could this be a new form of the pulse, she asked? A deeper, more fundamental manifestation of the planet's energy? Thorne nodded, her mind racing with possibilities. It's possible, she said, but we need more data, more analysis, to understand its true nature and its potential impact on the planet. The discovery of this new energy pattern ignited a frenzy of research activity. Scientists from across the colony, both human and Archerian, worked tirelessly to decipher its secrets. They deployed probes deep into the planet's core, analyzed seismic data, and consulted with experts from across the galaxy. The more they learned, the more awestruck they became. The energy pattern was not merely a geological phenomenon. It was the very essence of Cestus Roman III, a manifestation of its ancient spirit, its collective memory, its evolutionary potential. It was, in essence, the planet's soul. This revelation challenged their understanding of the universe, their place in it, and the very nature of consciousness. It opened up new possibilities, new questions, new frontiers of exploration. But it also brought with it a sense of responsibility, a realization that they were not just scientists, but custodians of a sacred trust, entrusted with the well-being of an entire planet. The revelation of the planet's soul sent shockwaves through the scientific community and beyond. It challenged the very foundations of their understanding of the universe, raising profound questions about consciousness, sentience, and the interconnectedness of all things. Thorne and Elara, at the forefront of this groundbreaking discovery, became the focal point of intense scrutiny and speculation. They were hailed as visionaries by some, heretics by others, their work sparking heated debates in academic circles and public forums alike. The Arcturian Council, initially alarmed by the discovery, eventually recognized its potential to revolutionize their understanding of the universe. They dispatched a team of their most esteemed scientists to Cestus Roman III, eager to collaborate with Thorne and Alara and unlock the secrets of this newfound phenomenon. The research intensified, with scientists from multiple species joining the effort. They delved deeper into the planet's core deploying advanced sensors and scanners to map the energy patterns and decipher their meaning. They studied the planet's history, its geological formations, and its unique biosphere, seeking clues to the origins and evolution of its consciousness. Their work yielded astonishing results. They discovered that the planet's soul, which they dubbed Gaia, was not merely a passive observer, but an active participant in the planet's evolution. It had guided the planet through countless epochs, shaping its landscapes, influencing its climate, and fostering the diversity of its life forms. Gaia communicated with them through dreams, visions, and subtle manipulations of the Cestus Pulse. It shared its wisdom, its knowledge, and its hopes for the future. It revealed the interconnectedness of all living beings, the delicate balance that sustained the planet's ecosystem, and the importance of respecting the natural world. Thorn and Elara, deeply moved by Gaia's revelations, became its most ardent advocates. They spoke out against the reckless exploitation of resources, the pollution of the environment, and the unchecked advancement of technology without regard for its consequences. They called for a new paradigm of interspecies cooperation, one based on mutual respect, shared responsibility, and a deep reverence for the natural world. Their message resonated with many, sparking a global movement for environmental protection and sustainable development. On Cestus Roman III, the colonists embraced a new way of life, one that honored the planet's spirit and sought to live in harmony with its rhythms. They implemented sustainable farming practices, developed clean energy sources, and established protected areas for the planet's unique flora and fauna. The Arcturians, initially skeptical of this spiritual approach, gradually came to appreciate its wisdom. They witnessed firsthand the positive impact of these changes on the planet's health and the well-being of its inhabitants. They began to question their own empire's practices, its relentless pursuit of technological advancement at the expense of the environment. A new era dawned on Cestus Roman III, 
an era of ecological awareness, interspecies cooperation, and a deep respect for the planet's soul. The colony, once a symbol of human ambition, had become a beacon of hope, a testament to the power of humanity to learn, to adapt, and to evolve, not just as individuals, but as part of a larger, interconnected whole. The ripple effects of Cestus Ebi's transformation extended far beyond its own borders. The colony's success story became a model for other planets grappling with environmental challenges and seeking to establish sustainable societies. Thorn and Alara, now recognized as leading experts in the field of xenometeorology and ecological engineering, traveled the galaxy, sharing their knowledge and inspiring others. They consulted with governments, advised corporations, and mentored a new generation of scientists dedicated to preserving the delicate balance of the universe. Their message, once dismissed as idealistic, gained traction as more and more species recognized the interconnectedness of all life and the need for responsible stewardship of the environment. A new wave of environmental awareness swept through the galactic community, leading to stricter regulations on resource extraction, the development of cleaner technologies, and a renewed focus on ecological restoration projects. The Arcturian Empire, once a symbol of technological dominance, underwent a profound transformation. Influenced by their experiences on Cestus Roman III, they reevaluated their priorities, shifting their focus from conquest and exploitation to collaboration and sustainability. They implemented sweeping reforms, investing in renewable energy, promoting biodiversity, and establishing protected areas on the countless worlds under their dominion. Kale, the once arrogant ambassador, found himself increasingly marginalized within the Empire's political circles. His warnings of human treachery and his calls for a more aggressive approach towards the colony were met with skepticism and disapproval. He was eventually recalled to Arcturus, his reputation tarnished, his influence diminished. Thorn and Alara, their mission accomplished, returned to Cestus Roman III, where they were greeted as heroes. The colony had continued to thrive in their absence, its society flourishing, its technology advancing, its people united in their shared purpose. One evening, as the sun set over the verdant valley, casting long shadows across the land, Thorn and Alara stood hand in hand, gazing out at the breathtaking panorama. The air was alive with the sounds of nature, the chirping of insects, the rustling of leaves, the gentle lapping of water against the shore. We did it, Thorn whispered, her voice filled with awe and gratitude. We changed the world. Elara squeezed her hand, her eyes reflecting the golden light of the sunset. We changed more than just this world, my love, she said, her voice a gentle chime. We changed the galaxy. They stood in silence for a moment, savoring the peace and beauty of the moment. Then, as the first stars began to twinkle in the darkening sky, they turned towards each other, their eyes locking in a shared understanding. They knew that their journey was far from over. There were still challenges to overcome, new frontiers to explore, and countless worlds in need of their expertise and compassion. But they also knew that they were not alone. They had each other, they had the support of their people, and they had the unwavering guidance of Gaia, the planet's wise and benevolent soul. Together, they would continue to strive for a brighter future, a future where all species lived in harmony with each other and with the natural world. The legacy of Cestus Roman III extended far beyond the boundaries of the planet itself. The lessons learned, the technologies developed, and the philosophy of harmonious coexistence reverberated throughout the galaxy sparking a new era of interstellar relations. The Arcturian Empire, once known for its relentless pursuit of technological advancement at any cost, underwent a profound cultural shift. Inspired by the humans' respect for nature and their willingness to collaborate with other species, the Arcturians began to prioritize environmental protection and sustainable development. They established the Galactic Environmental Protection Agency a multi-species organization dedicated to preserving the biodiversity and ecological integrity of countless worlds. They invested in research into renewable energy sources, reducing their reliance on fossil fuels and mitigating the impact of their vast industrial complex. The humans, in turn, benefited from the Arcturians' advanced knowledge and technology. 
they received access to vast libraries of scientific data, cutting-edge medical treatments, and sophisticated engineering tools. This exchange of knowledge and expertise accelerated their own technological progress, allowing them to tackle challenges that had once seemed insurmountable. The Verdant Valley, once a symbol of human defiance, became a pilgrimage site for scientists, diplomats, and spiritual seekers from across the galaxy. They came to witness the miracle of the terraformed oasis, to learn from the wisdom of Gaia, and to pay homage to the humans and Arcturians who had forged a path towards a brighter future. Thorn and Elada, their hair streaked with silver and their scales dulled with age, continued to live in their cottage, surrounded by the lush greenery they had helped to create. They became revered figures, their names whispered with reverence in the corridors of power and the hallowed halls of academia. Their children, a unique blend of human and Arcturian traits, grew up to become leaders in their own right, carrying on their parents' legacy of scientific inquiry, environmental stewardship, and interspecies collaboration. They traveled the stars, sharing their knowledge and inspiring others, their very existence a testament to the power of love to bridge the gap between different worlds. Cestus Roman III, once a forgotten backwater, had become a symbol of hope, a testament to the indomitable spirit of humanity and the transformative power of cooperation. Its story, a tale of laughter turned to awe, of adversity overcome through unity and ingenuity, would be told and retold for generations to come. A reminder that even in the face of overwhelming odds, the human spirit could soar, reaching for the stars and beyond.